We're very fortunate to have with us a couple of presenters who have been doing research in an area that I don't think gets a lot of attention in our hobby, most likely because of the stigmas attached to it, uh, autism and board gaming. And I think that stigmatism gets removed when we talk about it and we have facts about it, which they, they're able to provide with us. So I'm going to be welcoming to the stage uh, some people who travel a fair distance from Plymouth, UK, to discuss this topic, uh, Dr. Gray Atherton and Dr. Liam Cross. Hi everyone, thanks for, for sticking around. Okay, we're going to start our presentation today. As Rodney said, we're going to be presenting on Game Changer, exploring the role of board games in the lives of autistic people. Okay, so, um, so I think our talk's probably gonna be a little bit different from all of the others um, the last couple of days. So we're not kind of directly involved in the industry. Um, we're academics, we work at the University of Plymouth and we work in a psychology department, so we do research on lots of different areas. So most of our work is around kind of social change. So we look at social groups, we look at how we can encourage pro-sociality, um, prejudice, um, group dynamics, and also neurodiversity, and particularly areas of autistic strengths. So that's what kind of most of our research and our work looks at, but in our kind of spare time, we're also involved in the hobby, and we're big board gamers, and this is kind of how we fell into this area. So we applied for a project funded by Gaming Lab, looking at the kind of the overlap between autism and board games. Okay, so to give you some kind of background on what we're going to talk about today, Gray's going to start off by talking about what autism is. We'd normally then go into talking about what board games are, how kind of modern hobbyist board games are traditional from, different from traditional games and what the utility of board games is. But after talking to everyone here this week, no need for that. You guys know that much better than us. So we'll then go straight into kind of what's the overlap between autism and board games and why might those things be interesting kind of bedfellows. Okay, so autism is, oh, my mic sounds really loud. <laughs> yeah, sure. So autism is a neurodevelopmental condition, which means that we know that there are various aspects of autism that are different from the neurotypical or general population that have to do with cognition, so kind of neuro. And then it's developmental because people are born with autism. We diagnose it around the age of two. Autism has traits that are associated with it, and it's diagnosed by noticing that individuals with autism have social and communication differences. So these are things like reduced eye contact or maybe differences in the way that conversation ebbs and flows and often things like social anxiety. Some of the most famous autism research has to do with something that's called theory of mind, which means the ability to understand what other people are thinking. Some research suggests that autistic people might struggle with that, particularly when we test it in the lab using experimental tasks. But we know that autism comes with a lot of strengths. So many of you who might know autistic people know that they have a propensity for logic, rules, and systems. So they can get really stuck into understanding how things work and how things fit together within a system. A lot of autistic people also have what some people say are restricted interests or special interests, but in the autism community, we call them passions. And that means that people get really interested in something and might become experts in that area. Um, and also, autism exists on a spectrum. So that means a lot of different things. One of the ways that we talk about a spectrum is that, in a sense, everyone has some degree of autism. When you take a self-assessment of autistic traits, we see a general or we see a normal distribution, which means that most of us will fall kind of in the middle on having autistic traits. People with autism, though, will fall very high on this distribution. And also people that are siblings or parents of autistic people will also fall pretty high on that spectrum. And we call that the broad autism phenotype. Okay, so this started off with our own kind of personal observations in the hobby when we were going to board game cafes and meetups and groups and things we notice that there might either be an increased prevalence of autistic individuals involved in the hobby, or individuals involved in the hobby might be higher in autistic traits. Which we thought was really interesting, actually, as if you think about what board games involve, this kind of contradicts a lot of autism research and autism myths. So board games are an inherently social hobby. They involve us all agreeing to sit around a table and do something together. They're also a hobby that involves a high degree of um, perspective taking or theory of mind. 
So to play a board game, I need to think about what my opponent is doing, what's in their mind, what their strategy is. Are they bluffing me, trying to read their body language, all of this stuff? So it's really heavy on all of the stuff that autistic individuals are perhaps not to thought, thought not to do kind of as well as or do as much. So we thought this might be a really interesting kind of overlap. Um, first thing we did is we did this um, systematic literature review in the area to see what was already out there. And we found hardly any papers in this area. I think there's maybe four or five papers at the time when we did this in 2020. So very little research in this area. Okay. Do you yep. want to talk about our method? Yeah, sure. So, so Liam and I do, oh, yes. um, one of the things that we like to do are mixed methods research. So that means that we have the quantitative side, um, which we um, drive through sort of statistical analysis. And then we do qualitative research, which is, I think, a very important area of disability research, which is essentially saying, let's talk to individuals, let's get their uh, lived experience, and let's try and kind of generalize those findings by having a representative sample so that we can understand what, um, what's kind of driving a lot of our results. Because quantitative research will often get at sort of the what, what are the numbers, what is the data, but qual will maybe help us understand a bit of the why, which can then lead to more quantitative research. Okay, so with that in mind, kind of here's an overview of what we're going to be talking about today and the work that we've done. I'm going to start off with some quantitative work looking at a big data collection sample of what is the prevalence of autistic individuals involved in this hobby, and then what are their preferences. And then from there, we're going to talk about some of the qualitative and exploratory work that we've done to try and understand what it is autistic gamers are getting out of this hobby, why it's such a good fit, and then what happens if we introduce autistic newbies to the hobby. Um, and then to finish, we're kind of going to move on and not talk about autism so much and look at some work we've been doing to do with Dixit, and then also a big open access data set that we've produced looking at kind of gamer profiles, gamer preferences, and fit between different gaming mechanics and themes. Okay, so study one. In the first study we did for this project, we were just interested in kind of exploring what is the prevalence of autism in this population and looking at how autistic and non-autistic gamers might differ. So to do this, we surveyed just over one and a half thousand board gamers. Um, we recruited people from Facebook groups, um, distributor mailing lists, forums. We never mentioned autism in the call at all. We just asked for board gamers, gave them an online survey, and everybody got a free Steam copy of a, um, kind of a, a new board game at the time. Um, we assessed the demographics of people, so what mental health conditions they had, what age they were, um, socioeconomic status, level of education, all this stuff, and also their gaming preferences and motivations. So we took all of the kind of most used game themes and mechanics and things from Board Game Geek, what kind of play accounts people prefer, how long they prefer to play for, whether they prefer kind of American or Euro style games, etc. The thing we were probably most interested in was this, the rate of mental health and developmental conditions in the population. And we found bar two exceptions, every single one fell kind of roughly in line with what you'd expect to find in the general population. So just as much ADHD, dyslexia, all that kind of stuff, exactly what you'd expect to see in the, the wider population. Two exceptions. One was autism, which, as Gray said, you'd expect about 1% of people to have globally. We found between 5 and 7% of our sample had a clinical diagnosis. And the second was anxiety, which was about double what you'd expect to find in the general population, which is interesting as these are two um, conditions that often co-occur. So it's quite likely that when individuals have autism, they will also have anxiety. These things occur together. They're comorbid. And we also gave people a measure of autistic traits called the autism quotient, which is a 50 item self-report measure that asks people questions like, would you rather go to a party or a library? So things that measure kind of common autistic traits. Um, we analyzed that using a cutoff score of 26. So normally people who score above 26 or 30, are people who are classed in that BAP range that Gray was talking about. So they might not get a clinical diagnosis of autism, but they significantly, significantly elevated traits. Expect to find about 10% of people in that range in the general population. We found 30% in this sample. So good evidence that there's an increased prevalence of autism and high levels of autistic traits in this population, in board gamers. 
Um, we then also looked at autistic people's preferences in the hobby. So these are the list of game um, themes and game mechanics that autistic people liked, from most liked to least for both. And if people are interested in this data, um, there's a QR code and a link there where all of the data is available, open access for free for anyone to use. So if people are interested, for example, in designing games for autistic women or um, autistic people from a certain socioeconomic status or whatever, you can go into the data, sort by those characteristics, and look at what game themes does this group like, what mechanics do they like, what play accounts do they like, all of this kind of stuff. Um, yeah? Yeah, of course. I'll fix it at the end, but if not, there's also this link yeah. here. Okay, so we also looked at some kind of general comparisons between autistic and non-autistic gamers. And I'm gonna tell you kind of what some of the main key significant differences were. So these are all things that came out on statistical tests as different. But probably also important to note that there was a lot more similarities and differences overall, but these are some of the differences. So we found different motivations for gaming for neurotypical individuals, so individuals without autism. Social interaction was the main kind of motivation, the main drive for the hobby, whereas for autistic players, it was strategizing. So that was more important than social interaction. Autistic people also rated playing alone as more enjoyable than neurotypicals did. That doesn't mean that they um, would rather play alone than with other people. They rated playing with other people higher than alone. But neurotypical people rated playing alone really lowly. For autistic people, that, that difference was less. They also ranked certain game themes higher, particularly game themes around things like animals, transport, trains, and things that are often also common, um, autistic passions or restricted interests. They rated the mechanical aspects of the game as more important than neurotypical players did. And they were more likely to be hardcore gamers. And that was defined by playing for, was it more than 40 hours a month? And interestingly, they also ranked cooperative games much higher than neurotypical players did. So neurotypical players tended to prefer competitive games. Autistic people preferred cooperative games. So some really interesting differences here when we look at kind of historically what autism's thought to be. Okay, so we're seeing now that autistic and neurotypical players seem to be getting quite different things from this hobby. Next thing we wanted to do was kind of understand in a bit more depth what it is autistic players are getting out of this hobby, why they're involved in it, and why they're so prevalent in it. So to do this, we interviewed 13 autistic people. All of them were board gamers, but some of them were also board game designers. They were involved in distribution and running board game cafes and shops. Um, we analyze that data using interpretive phenological analysis. So this is a kind of qualitative analysis that's emergent and user-led. So you don't go into the data set with any kind of preconceptions or hypotheses about what you expect to find. And you kind of let the data speak for itself. We had two coders go in and code for any themes that they found. And we then developed a list of master themes that were present amongst all interviewees and common across all of the different interviews. And Gray's going to talk us through these, these themes. Yeah. yeah with these fabulous pictures I made on Dolly. <laughs> um, so, so we found four themes that helped sort of unpack what is it about board gaming that attracts the autistic population? Why do they like socializing using this, using board gaming as a vehicle? So one of the first things that we, we found that was throughout all of the interviews is that systems are stimulating and comforting. So. This is kind of in line with some famous theories about autism that have to do with systems or systemizing. Essentially, people um, felt like it was really interesting to get into um, a rule book and figure out how a game worked and how it fit together, how it related to other games that they had played. But also it was comforting because they were really good at doing this and they could kind of get stuck into a game and it felt like, like they were being kind of... Um, involved in something that they knew really well. It was relaxing in that sense. So special interests and escapism was something that participants talked about quite a bit. Games come in every type of theme and games use those themes really well. So they complement uh, the theme through the mechanic. And so people who are interested, for, interest, for example, in transport or in trains 
uh, they were able to play a number of games that really got them more deep into that hobby already. One of the kind of more significant ones that we were interested in is uh, the social aspects of gaming and how that intersected with autistic identity. Participants said that games were a social lubricant of sorts because the, um, as this kind of quote says, it's a structured environment in which to interact with other humans. We haven't got to worry as much about the whole insane social interaction thing. Interacting via the game, via the rules, that's the center of attention. All eyes are on the board, not on you. So people talked about this idea that conversation kind of naturally comes when you're interacting with people that have a lot in common with you because they're, we're all playing the same game. And also if there was ever a moment of kind of an awkward silence or pause, you could just go back to the game and it really took the pressure off. And then one thing that we are, kind of got us into this topic from the beginning is this idea of social deception games. So there's sort of research would suggest that autistic people maybe didn't like those games or weren't very good at those games. But from our experience, that's actually a decent chunk of kind of the board gaming experience is playing these kinds of party games where bluffing is involved. And so if autistic people were in this hobby, how did they navigate that? And we kind of found that it was split. Some participants said, actually, I think those games are great. I might not be the best player, but I really enjoy them. And I have gotten a lot better because I play them so much. They're so popular with other people. So I do find myself figuring out how to bluff and how to lie and how to trick. And then other participants, um, and granted, these are all adult participants, they said, well, I know that I'm autistic. And so I'm not very good at lying. And so I try and avoid those games. And I don't think that I need to develop that skill. So it's sort of an interesting um, dichotomy there between participants on this topic. So one of the other things that uh, we wanted to do was investigate the intersection between board gaming and people in the autistic community who had never played games. So we know that it attracts some people and they get really involved in the hobby, but what does it look like if we introduce it to people that have never played? Is it still going to be kind of compatible with autistic ways of being? Can we sit? Yeah, sure. Okay, so to do this, we traveled around the UK to a few different sites in the north and south of England. We went to various um, autistic kind of community centers and schools and things and played games with groups of people in about five to 10. Just under 30 autistic people took part in total. We were at each site for a morning or an afternoon, so four to five hours. We spent two or three hours playing a range of different games with people. Um, games that we most commonly played were Dixit, Werewolf, Codenames, and some other social deception games. Again, afterwards, um, interviewed everybody, and then analyzed the data again using IPA. Do you want to do the call stuff? Again? Yeah, sure. Um, so one of the things that we found, we know that autism is a spectrum, which means there's a lot of heterogeneity or there's a lot of variation in kind of people's um, sort of interests, the way they present, and also there can be some um, differences in kind of ability. And so a lot of the groups that we went to were entirely mixed in this sense. And it also meant that people had formed kind of their own groups, their own cliques, and they might not socialize across the entire group. And what um, participants reported from our focus groups afterwards is that actually that seemed to really change once the board games were introduced. We were able to play sort of huge multiplayer versions of Dixit and code names, and it meant that everyone was able to get around the table together, um, as this quote sort of talks about. Basically, instead of trying to make chit chat or trying to sort of uh, crowbar in how everyone can get along, uh, games did that really effortlessly. And then the other theme that we found, and we all know that board games can be incredibly challenging, learning the new rules to a game, even if you do it all the time, it still kind of stretches you as a person. And it's particularly, I think we might forget kind of how difficult it is for people that aren't used to doing that at all. And so our participants were really uh, sort of taken aback by the fact that they were able to take on that challenge. They were able to sit down and for the first time le learn how to play a werewolf or how to play a Dixit. And they were impressed with themselves. 
And it also sort of highlighted that in this, um, in the autistic community, sometimes when groups are meeting up, they're not doing things that are maybe as cognitively challenging as board games, but they are able to do those things and it actually can build a lot of self-confidence. Okay, so next thing we wanted to do was see what would happen if um, autistic people who weren't involved in the hobby got a more long-term exposure to this than just one afternoon. Um, so to do this, we worked with two sites. One was a community center in the Northwest for adults with autism and a range of other neurodevelopmental disabilities. So this was a group that had a lot of comorbid ID, Down syndrome, kind of a group with really high needs. The other was an SEN school in the Liverpool area working with autistic children where this was essentially kind of a last chance saloon school where they'd already been excluded from all other kind of educational environments. Um, children who had kind of very high disruptive behavior but very high IQ as well. So we went to each site once a week um, for a couple of hours each session over a one year period. Played a huge range of games with the different groups and afterwards interviewed the individual, so the students and their clients, but also the staff. So the teachers and the support workers who were at the community centers. And again, analyze this using interpretive phenological analysis. Um, so we've kind of blended these together for the purpose of this presentation, but these were two separate studies analyzed separately, but very similar findings. Yeah, so uh, some of the things that came out was that, and we know this, that uh, board games build relationships with people. And uh, through playing games, you learn a lot about people in action, in a sense. The way that they play a game is maybe the way they treat you in real life. And through gameplay, both groups just um, reported back that they had formed friendships and relationships with people that they hadn't necessarily expected to form. And it was a really healthy way to socialize, and it gave them a lot in common with one another. Uh, the other thing that we found, again, was this idea of skill building. So there were a lot of um, kind of challenges in both sites for playing the games. They were different challenges. For the children that were at the SEN school that had a lot of disruptive behavior, um, it, the challenges were things like inhibition, um, turn-taking, uh, sportsmanship, and these were things that sort of naturally were supported through gameplay because if one person sort of falls out in a sense, then the game is disrupted for everyone. And so peers would actually say, hey, calm down, please come back. We can't finish the game unless you come back. Um, and then for the group of adults, it was things like memory. So at the beginning when we started playing Dixit, people weren't able to remember which card they had put down. Very, very basic sort of um, difficulties with these kinds of executive functioning skills. But towards the end of the intervention, it was actually amazing how much they were able to completely run the game by themselves without any um, adult care support. And then finally, the theme that we found was independence. So we all know that in order to kind of feel that satisfaction when you win a game, you have to have done it yourself. And this was something that developed in both of the groups over time, this idea that I'm going to be playing this game and be responsible for the outcome of the game myself. And I think a really powerful quote we got from the um, adult care support workers was that it, they were taken aback by how much their clients could actually do themselves. So we were with them all the time. And sometimes we forget they're actually capable of doing stuff on their own. So we always sort of take over and say, we'll do this. But with this game, they've had to do it themselves. And it's been a bit of a learning curve for us to know they're actually capable of doing it. So, yeah. Um, so one thing that we're really interested in is the um, interest that we know many people on the spectrum have in role-playing games. Um, so D&D &D is something that anecdotally we know is really popular with neurodivergent people. And again, RPGs and being proficient and interested in RPGs are something that contradict a lot of autism myths. They're incredibly social games. They're all about being with people and spending time with people. They're also all about imagination. So some of the earliest studies on autism, the way you're supposed to understand autism is it's a group of people that have no imagination. But of course, how is that true? Because RPGs are entirely about using your mind's eye. 
And then one of the things that's really appealing about RPGs and an intersection with people that are neurodiverse or people with disabilities is that there's so many ways we can accommodate that through RPGs. So there's ways that you can modify the game. There's so much freedom in the game, but also they can be played um, online, which also is really helpful in terms of kind of being in uh, location independent. Uh, yeah. Okay, so um, the next study we ran was an autistic D&D &D campaign. So we had um, somebody who was already a DM come in and recruit autistic people, help them create characters, learn them the rules of D&D, &D, and then spent eight weeks playing the Waterdeep campaign with two groups, five players in each group. Afterwards, again, interviewed all of the people who took part and again, analyzed data using IPA. Do you want to go back or do you want to break? Yeah, you do it. Me too. Um, so one of the first themes that we found was around social motivation. So a lot of the participants talked about the way they were very socially motivated in real life outside of the game, but they had a lot of struggles with that, and that didn't always work very well for them. So this is kind of around the ways they wanted this social interaction, but they struggled with it, and it didn't necessarily work very naturally. But what everybody then went on to talk about was the way they... D&D kind of solved this for them, the way they had much better interaction in D&Ds and other tabletop role-playing games. So they had smoother communication. And the final theme was something we didn't necessarily expect, and it was around bleed and, ev and um, emotional investment. So bleed is a term that essentially means if you're playing a character, you start to embody the traits of that character, and that then bleeds over into your real life. So if you're playing D&D as this kind of strong, heroic character, after a period of time, you'll start to embody those characteristics and bring them out of the game and into the real world. Okay, we're gonna kind of start to move away a little bit now from autism and talk about some of the work we've done using Dixit. So I'm guessing everyone's already familiar with Dixit, how it works. Yep, cool. So, um, we introduced Dixit to a group of 70 people. Well, I guess what first happened actually is we were playing this game in, um, in a school, was it? And Gray put down a card, which was a puzzle piece, which if anyone's familiar with kind of autism and iconography is kind of um, relevant. So she put down this card of a puzzle piece and gave the clue of autism and then asked everyone else to put down whatever their card was that they thought matched autism and asked people, why did you choose that card? What was it about that card that kind of said autism to you? And we had some really interesting kind of responses and discussions with people around that. So we developed a study around this. And we went around the UK, again, small groups of autistic players, about 70 people in total, played Dixit with them for a while, taught them how to play Dixit, and then asked them to put down a card for the word autism and tell us about why did you choose that card and why does that say autism to you? What is it about this card? We analyzed this data using thematic analysis, so analysis on the themes that came out of the, um, the text, the verbal responses that people talked about. But we also used a method called photo elicitation, which is looking at the commonality in the pictures that people provided. So what the Dixit cards actually said about how this group conceptualizes autism, how autistic people see their own condition. So people talked a lot about the challenges that are inherent with autism. Um, some people felt like maybe it felt like they had kind of a monster inside, some kind of, um, some people felt that, like the loneliness, you're very isolated, you are your own island. Some people said things about not feeling real, feeling like they are sort of um, a copy in a sense, and it was difficult to blend in. But people also talked a lot about autistic strengths, so autistic people like to collect things. This person said the, um, the bird is like an autistic person. They're on top of the maze looking down, so they have kind of a brilliant viewpoint, if you will. And people talked about the aspects of autism that have to do with sort of being a, quite uh, advanced in certain areas, almost a genius. And then a lot of people talked about the idea of masking, so how society makes them feel like others. Um, there's a lot of uh, kind of rules that autistic people are breaking, and they're kind of also have to put on a suit of armor because there's a very vulnerable person inside. A lot of really deep sort of insights in this, yep. Yeah. Okay, so we got really interested from here in, in Dixit 
and how this might be able to be used as a tool both to understand how people conceptualize stuff, but maybe also as a therapeutic tool, a way to kind of gamify therapy and get people talking about stuff in a more enjoyable and naturalistic environment. So we then ran a study um, in two schools with 70 children. I say we, this was one of our grad students, um, where she was interested in looking at how children discuss hard to talk about topics. So in the UK, we have a specific part of the curriculum called IPE, IP, which mm -hmm. is interpersonal, emotional, interpersonal, emotional yeah. development stuff. So it's essentially where children learn about emotional and developmental things in school. And the way this normally works essentially is very, very varied dependent on which school. And will often just involve things like kids kind of sitting and doing emotional word word searches and stuff that aren't that engaging. So we brought Dixit into these lessons and children in these lessons played Dixit. Um, over one school term, which is 12 weeks. So they would learn to play Dixit for a couple of weeks, and then after that, the facilitator each week would give a clue for a difficult to talk about topic. So things like bullying, divorce, grief, mental health, and disabilities. And then through Dixit, we asked the children to put down cards that represented this stuff, and then have conversations about what bullying has meant to them and how they've experienced that in their lives, or whatever that week's topic was. Analyze this in quite a few different ways. One was using a kind of analysis called semantic analysis, which is essentially looking at the content. So what is it that participants said about those topics? And here's a couple of examples we got from each one. But we think the, the way they did that, the latent stuff, was actually a lot more interesting. So the latent is how or what tools they use to talk about the different topics. So this is more about how they use the Dixit cards and what that added. Yeah, so, so Dixit, of course, has incredibly meaningful and emotional in, um, imagery. And uh, the children would always almost talk about emotions in a sense and the kind of what we call the gestalt or holistic way that the card would make them feel something. Uh, the cards also brought out a lot of personal kind of memories, things that were about their past, their their past, and it would bring out sort of stories from their well, they were in childhood, but earlier childhood, if you will. And then Dixit cards, you're able to use them to tell a story, and children, of course, uh, are already very used to using pictures as stories. This is kind of they're in the, that time, that age where sort of they're bridging from picture books to kind of full narrative books. And so they, the, they were very easily able to adapt the Dixit cards to tell stories that were very rich in detail, connected the dots between the sort of nonsensical combination of images. Yeah, and so we, we asked the children sort of what was the effect of this? Uh, how, did, how did it work in this class? Uh, people felt overall like it, or the children thought it was really successful. It helped them kind of talk about things more easily. But I think part of it is that the icebreaker was the game. Uh, because you're able to hold up a card and show what your picture is, it allows you to understand the perspective of other people, which is definitely a very developing skill at around this age, at around 10. It's not fully developed, so the cards are a big help for that. And then the pictures are so engaging. Children loved the pictures. We all love the Dixit pictures. Everything is better with Dixit pictures. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so we're, we're, what did we cover? What are our conclusions? Uh, games naturally teach. So when we play games, we all do it because it's fun. And that's why all of the people that we played games with during the course of the study played. But in doing so, they were um, learning quite a bit about themselves, about other people, and also building cognitive skills. Um, the big takeaway for us with the connection between why games for the autistic community, um, games uh, make social situations flow naturally. You don't have to mask, you don't have to come up with things on the spot or be the most charming person in the room to make a friend. The games are supporting all of those interactions and they make sense to the community. And board games build communities. So you're able to go to meetups, you're able to go to the magic shop and play in a tournament and you know where you belong and it gives also a structure for what you're going to be doing with your time, and that's really important. And also I think part of it is that autistic people are quite good at board games, 
So it's not forcing yourself to be in a situation where you think, I'll try and get through this. Hopefully people won't notice this is hard for me. They're doing great in that situation, and they want to be there. OK. So to finish, we're going to kind of move topics again and completely stop talking about autism and talk about some kind of big data projects we've been doing, looking at kind of what makes up board gamers, their demographics, their preferences, and what we might be able to, how we can use big data to kind of better understand this. Okay, so hopefully this QR code does work this time if people want to see the data and want to have a look at this. So this is a large data set where we surveyed thousands of board gamers on what mechanics they like, what play styles they like, and a ton of other stuff. So we have all of the most common um, game mechanics from Board Game Geek, most common themes, type of games people like, styles, et cetera, et cetera, hundreds and hundreds of questions in this. And um, this data allows for many different kinds of comparisons across different kinds of gamers. So we can compare male and female gamers, what their preferences are, what kind of mechanics they like, what kind of themes they like. And one of the things we've just started doing um, with this data, with Asthma Day Research, is looking at how different game mechanics and different game themes correlate and work with each other. So these are essentially correlation matrices looking at game themes. So the more blue that square is, the stronger the correlation between those two things. So industry, manufacturing, and trading themes work very well with farming stuff. So those themes work very well together, whereas the white stuff, we have a correlation of zero, so say war and fantasy doesn't work very well. So blue is people really, really liking stuff. Red is people really, really hating stuff, or the combination of that stuff together. So we can see if people like one game theme, what other game themes are they most likely to like? And we can also do the same with this data looking at mechanics. So we can see, obviously, that deduction, social deduction, hidden information, all works very well together. So those are game mechanics that people like together, but they don't like to see this stuff as much. So it doesn't make sense to have a worker placement game with hidden information and social deduction. People don't like those things as much. And if people are interested in looking at this data, so this is for the global population. This is for everyone, all of the thousands of people together. But you can also rerun that same analysis for the female gamers or autistic gamers or younger gamers. So if people are interested in designing a game for a specific population, this data can be used to tell you a little bit about what that um, population's preferences and motivations are. You can also look at their preferred play accounts, play times, all that kind of stuff. Um, one other thing we've done is correlated the way themes and mechanics also live together. So we can see, for example, that um, games with crime themes tend to work very well with storytelling and deduction stuff, but less well, say, with take that mechanics or bidding and auction stuff. So we can see across uh, mechanic and theme what kind of stuff lives well together, what kind of stuff doesn't gel well together. And again, this is for the overall global population, but if people are interested in reproducing this for a subset, say female gamers, can easily do that. And finally, the last thing that we've done that we're hoping to get some feedback on actually is we're not, this is quite new and we're still not very sure about this ourselves, is using a process called K-means to take all of that data that we have from all of those individuals and all of those different questions and make player profiles. So it essentially makes a cluster of best fit. So we get these six categories come out, and these six categories pretty well represent the, the distribution of stuff that we have. So we have kind of six categories of gamers, gamer, that have come out of our data. And the first one is people who just seem to rate everything highly. They seem to love every mechanic, love every theme. They're just optimists. So we're calling those lovers for the moment. And here's how many of those there are. That was 16% of the sample. 22% um, of our sample were the exact opposite. They were haters. They just hate everything. They're pessimists. <laughs> they rate everything super lowly, with one exception, player elimination. They love player elimination, <laughs> which is interesting, because that's not what anyone else liked. So bad people. <laughs> um, Next group we're thinking might be role players. That might be a good way to term them. But again, if you guys had um, any suggestions on better ways to, to kind of think about these, that would be really helpful. So these are people who rated fantasy, horror, role-playing, and dungeon crawling quite
quite highly. These are the stuff that they're in-gaming for. That's what they like. And they don't like this stuff. So they don't like kind of the more Euro-y type um, themes and also player elimination. Um, next, we thought this is probably people who are into Euro gamers. People who are into Euro games. So Euro gamers, they like trains, transport, industry type themes. And they like building worker placement mechanics. They really dislike the role playing stuff. And that was, what was that? That was about 18% of our sample. Um, next is a group of people who, again, like player elimination, but they also like social deduction, hidden information, traitor roles, and alliances, and dislike tile placement, deck bag building, farming, so they're getting the kind of more Euro y stuff. So, probably social gamers, people who enjoy social deduction games, party games, kind of lighter games. Um, and then the last theme, which is the one we're really understanding the least at the moment, and is about 10% of our data, is pe people who seem to enjoy serious or mechanical games. So they really, really dislike player elimination, really strongly, correlation of 0 0.97, almost the highest you can get. Um, yeah, really dislike player elimination, dislike role playing, but like um, engine building and hand management. So those are the two things they seem to be in it for. Again, dislike all of the kind of the social deception-y type stuff. So if, yeah, people did have any feedback about anything we might be getting wrong here and how we're thinking about these categories, we'd love to hear that before we try and publish this. Okay, so that brings us to the end. I wanted to thank um, Gaming Lab for funding this project, all of the other academics and grad students who have worked on this. Thank you to you all for giving up part of your morning listening to this. interested that's where you can find the actual papers if you want to read them and then there's our email address if you email us i'll send you data could we put this i didn't do that actually oh. there we go i'm gonna put that down <laughs> um, so I guess the, the big data is probably the easiest way that people could do that. All of that data is freely available. Um, anyone with any basic Excel skills or R skills can go in, organize that data however they want, play around and look at it. If you do want to make games for autistic people or particularly for women, what do those individuals like and what are they most likely to kind of get along with in the game? Um, was there anything else you wanted to? Um, let's see. I think I think it's maybe just a sort of a growing realization that these games are are incredibly important to sort of certain neuro uh, neuro diverse groups and kind of thinking of more about accessibility and how we can integrate those communities more better even better than they already are into kind of the gaming community. Um, yeah, I think that that's an interest. I think that that's the direction that things will start to be going, but. Doing that as soon as possible is always good. I would probably add as well, if, if people are interested in making games for those specific subsets of people, talking to them is probably the best way. And that's how we found all of this out, by just going to those groups and asking them. They're the experts in kind of their lives and what they like, right? So yeah, that's. So one, presentation was great. Um, and I appreciate the time that you've taken with these kids because this is important. Um, I would like to know out of the category of games that were here this weekend, what games do you feel could be added to your list of games that you logging out there that go by right now? <laughs> you mean that have a similar impact like Dixon yeah, did? Yeah, yeah. like you're very gosh, I go to Dixon, but did you see any games this weekend that could fall within that kind of like interest to you to represent to the kids that that's a really difficult question because we've been a little bit naughty and spent most of the week playing like NSFW games and <laughs> silly social games. You should not play with children. Uh, <laughs> so we're not going to recommend those. <laughs> so you've ruled some out. <laughs> we have ruled out some games. Exactly. Um, but through working, um, through the other work that we've done, I think we do probably have some games that we would recommend for children. Social deduction games worked really well. They love being able to trick people. They love kind of lying in a game. And we found there was so much opportunity for skill building. I remember one of the teachers saying to us, kind of 
a bit conversely, I guess, it's, it's really important that these children actually learn how to lie. That's something they really struggle with, but it's a life skill they need. And they've never seen them kind of be as comfortable doing that as through the games. So I think for children, social deduction games are probably the biggest. I quite liked them. Um, I tried Trio. I really liked that sort of very easy to learn, easy to pick up. But it's also building on memory. I thought that was really great. One thing that comes out a lot in our research is kind of animals. So I thought Harmonies was lovely for that. It also teaches a little bit about kind of habitats, animals, um, a lot of, I mean, it's actually, it, it is one of the preferred themes of the autistic community is animals. And we know that's in so many games. It's kind of like a playful approach, I think, that makes it a very disarming activity. Um, and then I guess the other one, um, I think that role playing games are incredibly important to the adult autistic community. So D&D &D is, of course, incredibly popular, but there's all different kinds of systems as well. But I think people absolutely love the fantasy element of D&D. &D. So for adult learners, I think that would be huge. And teens. Hey. So I think we're after personnel. Yeah. Sorry, I just had a, a question, possibly clarification, on the thematic and mechanics matrix. Mm -hmm. Uh, was that a study of the themes and mechanics that respondents had said that they liked or personally enjoyed appearing together, or was that um, uh, were respondents saying which ones worked well together? No, they were asked about each one individually. So it was a list. They were um, for each individual theme and mechanic. They were asked how much they like that component in a game on a scale of. And then you uh, exactly. You so yeah, we created a matrix of which things kind of co-occurred in liking. Then was there, is there some sort of thought or correction to mechanics that naturally don't fit together, or is that not even part of it, because it's, it's figured out individually, so there? So we did find, yeah, that there was mechanics that definitely didn't fit together, and there was corrections applied to them, but we didn't do the stats. We had a statistician come in and do all of the stats for this, but it's all in the paper as well. Uh, and then types of, of games, six types, how, how are you differentiating Euro from serious mechanical? I'm really struggling with how to differentiate those two categories myself, actually. There's a lot of overlap, but they did come out um, statistically as distinct categories. Yeah. Was that, was Which that is, later category more based on the complexity of the game? That. Could I um, have the clicker back and I'll go back a slide, actually? Sorry, I saw him running. Well, I was just curious if, if that later category was representing uh, heavier, more complex games. Is that what that was trying to call out, the serious mechanical gamers? Was that less about the style of the game and more about the complexity of the game? I was just curious if that was... So the reason we ended up going for that kind of, the, that way of thinking about this is this seemed to be a group of people who didn't care at all about theme. They were in it for the mechanics. They liked certain mechanics and they really disliked others. Right. So that, that's why we were kind of thinking about this in this way. Whereas the people who were, thought might be kind of more into the Euro games, it, it wasn't just about mechanics, it was also certain <coughs> themes that seemed to be more common right. in those games. I guess one thing that's an interesting way also to think about it is, or one way to ba work backward is what kind of games fit into that category and how can we understand the types of players that we would associate with that type of game. And I think that last category was one that it was hard to really conceptualize what that game would, what that game was, but yeah. it, it was a distinct category and it's also the smallest. So it's only about 8%. So again, what kind of, what is the small group? No, it's interesting. I had another question. Um, we were talking about this a little bit before, about how I found coming into the hobby, I didn't really have an awareness. I'm not colorblind. I don't have awareness of colorblindness. And I started playing more and more games, and I realized, oh, there's a large segment of the population struggles with colorblindness. And that became a, a more, a bigger conversation in our community. And I saw over time more and more uh, a calling out for we need more tools within our games to accommodate the colorblind players, right? <coughs> it changed over the years. Are there, are there tools or things that could be added to games that we already have in production that would help autistic players? Mm. Like, I don't, I, with color blindness, I go, oh, we put a symbol on this color now, and that solves what a photo helps with that problem. With autism, are there any, any tools like that that, that uh, <coughs> publishers could consider in how they present either their rule books or the components of the game? 
Yeah, I think the rule books is a, is a great point. So I think that autistic people are not struggling with the rules part of the rule books, but it might be having more clear understanding of sort of what to do when maybe there's conflicts arising or miscommunication or discussion that needs to happen, how we can maybe adapt games when people want to make a house rule, those kinds of nebulous social parts of a game that maybe could cause some anxiety or frustration for people that aren't sure how to navigate that. I think that could be kind of a, a, a not an easy win, but something to consult the community about adding that could make a huge difference one of the things that I really like about making adaptations for neurodivergent people is that they are put in place for neurodivergent people, but they end up helping everyone. And so if we can think about how to improve games like that, then it would probably be something everyone could really use to have an easier game. So, yeah, good question. Uh, so when it goes to look, you're just talking about the different categories and possibly how you classify it. When I'm looking at the role play, player category, um, and you guys are talking about the fancy course or role playing and like dungeon crawling, I I like to consider that immersive. Uh, so look at immersive because you're like in any of those, you're you're invoking certain sort of feelings and you're like in it. To your I would I sort of like that. Um, this is a suggestion from players that I have in my cafe. Great idea. Uh, the last one. Mechanical gamers, like if you're going to go deeper into a subset, like like this is a great overall perspective, and obviously you guys have done crazy amounts of work. Uh, but when it goes to like serious mechanical gamers, you can see that in almost any game. Like they'll say like, oh, I don't want to role playing, but within D and D, like you have people that are like, I want to like the DMs are very catered to specific styles, and you're gonna have that. You're gonna have a DM like, oh, you just need to do the voices, everyone's in, everyone's role playing for themselves. And you can have a player that's going to join the TV group, and maybe they're doing that, <coughs> that player is literally all they're doing, they're metagaming. They're doing mechanical things that are yeah. perfectly optimized every turn, and that's what I'm thinking about. Yeah. And they're still going to like that stuff. But like, I, I have a chance this is like an overall perspective. You just perfectly described our D&D group. But that's <laughs> us. <laughs> opposite players. Yeah, uh, so when it comes to these six categories, are they representing like 100% of gamers, or is this representing like 85% of gamers and there's 15% that are unaccounted for in these stats? It wasn't 100%, but it was a very good fit. I forgot the exact number, but it, it was well above 50%. It was like 60, 70, 80%, something like okay. that. But again, it'll be in the paper. Any, like, like notable uh, consistencies across the people that were uncategorized? We haven't looked for that. Actually, so k-means wouldn't tell us that, it'll just tell us that out of all of the different permutations that could be done, this is the best fit that explains the most variance. So no other category structure would explain more variance than this, but it doesn't tell us anything about those people that doesn't fit. And I'm, I'm, there would actually be a way to do that, but I'm not sure what it is off the top of my head, but we're definitely going to be emailing our colleague to figure that out when we get home. You should note, note these down. Yeah, I Misha, could you note those two things down for us? Could you note those last two questions down for us so we don't forget them? Thank you. Um, I have, first I have a statement and a question. So I just wanted to say that when you're talking about Dixon and you talk about how the, the players were actually fighting for themselves with that regiment, I think that's great because so often the artistic community is spoken to and not asked to define what it means for themselves. So I think that's that's one of the things that games are going to be so so useful for. The other thing I want to, uh, we, we've talked before, so I just wanted to touch on this again, the, um, how this could also help the autistic or non-autistic community empathize, perhaps, with the autistic community. Could you talk a little bit to that when they're playing together? Yeah, so, so one of the kind of concepts of, that we talk about a lot in autism research or starting to talk about is this idea of double empathy, which is that autistic people are asked a lot to think about what a neurotypical or even the harmful word normal people um, are thinking so that they can try and be like that. But we don't think a lot about what it's like to be autistic. And of course, we, as we discussed in games, it's all about taking people's perspectives and trying to understand our opponent or our teammate. And so I think that it's an incredible tool for that. Um, maybe even particularly in games where, where you are sort of taking on personas 
and uh, everyone's kind of on an even playing field of being something different. And so I think that playing in mixed, we've played primarily in all autistic groups, but I think our next step for our research is to investigate mixed groups and how we can improve on that communication across neurotypes. Yeah, I think that's a great point and it needs to happen. Yeah, that's one of the things we want to do next is see if we can use this to kind of build community integration and bring those groups together. together. Away after yeah. Yeah. Um, hi. We, we chatted a little bit as well, too, a little bit earlier uh, with the interviews and stuff, but I was kind of curious. We, uh, you guys were talking about the analysis for Dixit, and you separated like the challenges, the strength, and the, um, what was the other one, society, I think? Yeah. What's like the one that came up the most? And do you think that if you were to redo this analysis, it would be different if you would change it with like the, like the age ranges, for instance? Yeah. Do you think it would like differ? Which one was like the, the one that came out the most? I think society came up the most. Um, I think that if we redid it with kids, I think there would probably be a lot more positive statements. Yeah. I do. I think that um, by the time that autistic adults get to adulthood, they've gotten a lot of really negative messages. And I think a lot of that's changing generationally. Um, and so a lot of the kids that we work with, their autism is just much less of a barrier. For instance, the social deception stuff. Kids absolutely love playing those, and by the time, and they think they're amazing. They are amazing at them. They're better than me. And then by the time, <laughs> and I'm amazing at them too. <laughs> And then by the time that we talk to adults about it, they say, well, of course I'm bad at those. I'm autistic. Why would you think I would be good at werewolf? Why would I be good at hiding who I am? So, yeah, I think that we would probably, and we should redo that, Tommy. That's a really good idea. Yeah, because the, the cards that you guys showcase, like, I've worked with the, the brand for, like, years, um, and the, the artwork that you guys showcase have really deep meetings and very dark meetings as well. Very so dark. I'm very surprised with the cards that you guys like showed. So yeah. uh, w w w were these cards used with the analysis or you guys use like uh, like an array of the different cards and the different these extensions? Cards. Or? Yeah, well, so we had the full set of every expansion. Not yeah. every individual card to go through all of those because that would be overwhelming. But yeah, we used all of the cards throughout. Those are some of the 70 cards that were actually chosen by yeah. like people going to pay that. We then publish all of the, the actual cards as well. But we have also done this not with Dixit, actually, where we just have people upload photos that conceptualize okay. autism to them and then use it to compare with the differences between autistic and non-autistic people, between men and women, between older and younger generations. So that is something we're interested in doing next with mm -hmm. Dixit as well, particularly looking at how autistic and non-autistic or holistic people um, conceptualize it and what differences there might be. Because we can then analyze that quantitatively as well. We can do counts for how many times specific things like positives or negative strengths or weaknesses came up and statistically compare across groups, which is what we've done when we've had bigger samples uploading photos rather than Dixit. But yeah, that's, that's cool. I have a question about the statement. <laughs> uh, so I myself am of the neuro spicy community. The term I like to use. <laughs> <laughs> so please if you want. Um, so I think it's not, it's great that these studies are coming to light now, but we as a community need to kind of work together to kind of use this information and do better, to work together with that neurotypical and neurodiverse people. So how can we use this information going forward in the community? So I guess that's a question to you, what would be the best way for us to use it? I mean, I think, I think one of the, the big takeaways for us from this is that this is something that we, uh, in a gaming community, we need to be aware that many, many people that are passionate about board games will be neurodiverse. And it might be something that we just, maybe just weren't actually, uh, it wasn't as clear, but our data from a really big sample for psychological research certainly suggests, yeah, this is something we need to pay attention to. We need to be thinking about inclusivity and maybe making, um, making an obvious effort to highlight that neurodiversity is a part of the board gaming community and it should be a part of uh, kind of branding, imaging, stores, making that space really clear. I think that the gaming community is doing a really great job with kind of um, queerity being re represented in games and neurodivergence falls kind of in that same sort of minority 
um, category, and I think that it will start to be more visible in the gaming community. Hopefully, research like this has helped with that. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say integration is probably one of the big things as well. So um, a lot of the schools we worked with at first were kind of hesitant to involve games. They saw them as kind of an outside activity, something that's done for fun, as play, not educational. And I think the more research is done that shows that there's actually effects that can be had. We can measure this stuff. We can actually see benefits. I think schools and other places will start to take it more seriously and be more willing to, to use gamification in games. Okay. 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 Sorry, just for like say nonverbal autistic children with Dixit, how would you, um, I haven't yet played, but I am going to go learn it. Um, how do you adjust the game if they're nonverbal? Like, do they just point to the pictures? Or? Yep. So, one of the things we worked, found worked really well was having people pair up. So yeah, we had people who struggled to hold the cards but were better at verbalizing stuff and people who could hold the cards and do physical stuff but couldn't verbalize. So having people play in pairs, mm -hmm. we found really well. People really liked playing cooperatively. Um, we've also adapted the rules to work with some of those groups. With Some of the stuff went into the Dix Access Plus. So yeah, we did a lot of stuff. Um, also, so people found the rules and the board very difficult, I think, in the yeah. Adult Community Center. <laughs> groups, so a lot of work went into kind of simplifying that and making that much easier. And um, we also had issues around memory of people forgetting what card was theirs, so there's something in there where you kind of get a reminder of which card was yours based on numbers. Yeah. I have a question, he has a question. Yeah. Oh, okay. Go ahead, hold it. Yeah. Go ahead, and then I'll take um, I want to know if your data, how much variance within your data set across uh, autistic men versus autistic women. Mm -hmm. Um, like in my experience, there's a lot of variance in which, like which subset of gamers they would fit into, and that had a larger effect on the data. So there was more men overall in the sample, first of all. I think it was, a, not massively though, I think it was about 60, 70 percent. Again, all of this is in the, yeah. the, like the exact numbers are in the paper. Um, Autism's always, there's always more autism amongst males. Males are more likely to be diagnosed. So again, there was more autistic males than females, but not as much as you might expect. Um, in terms of comparing autistic males and females, we haven't specifically done that with the data. But yeah, the data's there for it to be done. Did I miss anything from that question? Did you want to? Uh, yeah, don't go ahead. Can you guys just come back next year, please? <laughs> <laughs> This took like six years. We would not be able to do all of this again by next year. We're exhausted. <laughs> From time, I may have these good questions. This right in. Do you have a set of like games that is good for this group so that we can like, let's say if we reach out to this group, we can, we know what games to bring. Instead of taking a risk, you know, yeah. Yeah, so the, the games that worked well for us, um, for younger children, the social deduction games, tricking games, anything where there's a bit of kind of mischief involved really helps them get involved. Um, Dixit, we also found really good. Code names, we had a lot of success with. I guess what I would say, though, is that personal choice is a huge part of sort of getting people involved. So if you know a lot of games and you feel comfortable bringing a lot of games and saying, just see what you like, I can tell you a bit about them, pick something that you'd like. Um, people get attracted by the artwork, they think, oh, I like that theme. So I think flexibility is really part of it. Like one size won't fit all for, for each person, but that's why board games are so amazing for this community, because you have infinite choice. Um, so yeah, I would say actually all of them. <laughs> yeah. Games are also important when, there's a, when uh, autistic people are interested in a certain thing, if you have a theme that matches that, that can be massive. Oh, sorry, that was for me. <laughs> There's so many questions, it's amazing. We get you two more questions. Um, so I know I saw a hand somewhere in this area. Oh, okay. On your previous slide with the blue and white boxes, how do we show the white boxes the game are existing? Say that again, I didn't hear that. How do we show the game The white exists? boxes here, yep. the white square. You yep. mean that people that don't like this type of game but how to be sure this type of game exists? Mm. 
So yeah, the, the white boxes are correlations of zero, so people having neither a, a positive or a negative um, association there. We actually, well not us, but Emmanuel actually did some kind of um, fit data, so looking at using this data to look at certain games. They did some stuff with Catan, looking at what kind of expansions would work best given this data and seeing are the games that perform way, um, really well, do they fit this structure and is kind of a, we, is this data useful for that? And I think they had quite a bit of success with that. And I think they were actually using it to try and predict what would work well next. But I'm not sure how much of that I saw. I guess so, and I'm not a game designer, so maybe I shouldn't say, but I think it is fascinating, though, to think also about the games that don't fit this structure and that are almost an exception to the rule and how that kind of may maybe that creativity of that also could be really interesting to a game developer, how they could create something that maybe wouldn't intuitively go together, but is kind of genre changing in that sense. So it's interesting for a few different reasons. Yeah, so I think Gray's absolutely right, actually. While this kind of big, broad data can tell us a lot about averages and what, there are always gonna be exceptions. Yeah. So one of my favorite games, Nemesis, sci-fi and player elimination, shouldn't work, right? Those things shouldn't go well together, but that really works. So I think there's always gonna be exceptions to this as well. And I saw a hand over here. Oh, I have to reach So will you? And then um, we'll finish with Emma. So, um, Partially statement, partially question. So um, I was thinking of the, the six categories and maybe rather than Euro, if you were to say like industrial gamers, because mm -hmm. I'm looking at like the trains, the industry, um, what else was there on there? Building, farming. Farm, right, so it's yeah. all like that industrial kind of, so like the gamers who are into like that industrial this, rather than calling it your games, which then falls into the mechanical games, it does. Like, right? Like Euro games is there's a lot of role players who also like Euro games, like so something like that. And then also we were yeah. saying like lovers instead of using like ultra like, ultras, is that exactly? ultra like, just somebody who loves everything, like they're yeah. always positive about every every aspect. Um, and then obviously <clears throat> us coming from like, the teacher lens. Mm -hmm. um, we we're saying that it's it's really interesting because a lot of autistic kids we see in daycare and schools they do a lot of that parallel play. It's interesting. We were playing umbrellas last night, and I was saying that you know it's interesting because you can play that game by yourself. Like you kind of paying attention to whatever I'm doing, where the umbrellas are going, but you're so focused on your own game and your own board and your own pieces that I wonder if it would be lead up to a second. You know, it took you five, six years to do this study, but we'll um, do it. Don't worry. Right? Yeah. <laughs> of like parallel play in the autistic community and how the, like, a lot of the board games are coming out with a solo mode variant. How would it be if he was playing a solo mode, I'm playing solo mode of the same game, and the communication that happens between us to talk about strategy of like, well, when I played my solo, I did this. What did you do? Yeah. And that comparative, just parallel play rather than doing something together for those that might be intimidated by that togetherness. Yeah, they can walk away when they want to, right? They get frustrated and they can walk away and come back to I think you're kind of tapping into one of the things that we really liked about kind of study one, which is we said all the ways that autistic players might do things differently, but the most important component of that is that you can do things differently. You can get different things out of a game. You can play a game for different reasons, but it's still playing the game. And that's a really good point. I like, I've never heard of parallel play. I'm gonna look that up. It's good. And uh, did you wanna finish with it? No, okay. Well, I'm so sorry we're running out of time, but uh, it's very interesting. I think everybody's thoroughly. Thank you. Thanks.